I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Most everyone will know uh, who Dr. Jeremy Fry is from Permute. He is, of course, joining us from Oxford in the UK, where our company is located. Uh, Jeremy gained his Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Oxford, developing gene therapy strategies to induce immunological tolerance in transplant recipients. Jeremy joined Promune to develop a new class of MHC class 1 multimers, leading to the invention of MHC pentamers. And for the past 19 years at Promune, as Promune's Director of Sales, he has led the sales team in a growing business, focusing on developing and implementing innovative technologies that radically improve our understanding of immune responses. So Jeremy will be discussing Promune's integrated approach to managing immunogenicity risk and drug immune modulation. Jeremy. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, all right, so um, the good thing about speaking now is that we've had a lot of people already mentioning a lot of what I'm gonna be saying, so I don't need to spend too much time on it. But I think it is really important because the area that we're working in is really rapidly changing. Um, that when we're thinking about uh, unwanted immune responses and we think about developing new biological drugs, it's really important to consider not just classical antibody therapeutics, but of course the wider context, uh, even thinking about uh, gene therapy, which ultimately is not talking about proteins, but is talking about um, genetic sequence, which ultimately will then encode for proteins that are being produced inside our cells. So um, when we think about immunogenicity, it's really important to look at that wider context. And uh, we've also heard the real critical importance of um, being able to understand unwanted immunogenicity from the earliest possible time point. If we can manage that risk um, from a design perspective, that's really going to ensure that uh, the molecules that we're developing are going to reach market without a competitive disadvantage and with have the best efficacy and safety profile that they can have in regards to delivering them to patients and having a molecule that is going to work. Um, so unfortunately, we know that unwanted immune responses can result in treatment failure. And the part of that is because it's a very complex area. And so predicting that is essentially uh, something which, you know, many people you've heard about talking to, to heard talking today have been um, trying to do and have done that to some degree of success. Um, but it's not an easy area. And the reason that it's not simple is because it is driven by a very complex set of different factors, some of which are kind of competing. The best way of uh, thinking about that is to think about both extrinsic factors and intrinsic factors. So extrinsic factors are those sort of outside the, the, the main molecule itself, so how you're delivering your, your therapeutic. Uh, Amy mentioned about the frequency of exposure, the dosing, uh, the patient's own immune system status, whether they're hypo or hyper-responsive. Uh, do they have pre-existing anti-drug antibodies or cross-reactive uh, antibodies? What's their HLA type, so the genetic uh, status as well. These all have big, big impacts. And then there are things that as drug developers we have some control over. And you've heard Thomas, Thomas talk in regard, and Tim's talk about um, actually the, the best ways of thinking about how we can address um, having um, improved sequences that are going to then lead to low immune responses. So uh, the actual amino acid sequence of the drug is a very obvious starting point, of course, but also how is that drug formulated? Um, its aggregation state or status, um, code on optimization is a very hot topic we have to think about, even if the protein has exactly the same sequence, the codons and how they're optimized and how they're used within the cell can actually make, have a big impact on um, subsequent immune responses. And uh, we've also heard from, from Tim talking about proteins um, in the antigen presentation assay, which can ha have different differential presentations based on um, half-life extensions, for example, and the profile that's then uh, seen by the immune system can be very radically different. So take home message being that demonstrating equivalent or reduced antigenicity in your biotherapeutic really does have some very significant benefits. So thinking about that, the immune response is obviously very complicated, but uh, this cartoon just simplifies things right down to thinking about how we can um, uh, characterize these unwanted immune responses. So biological therapies shown in this red star here are taken up um, by cells of the immune system, so antigen presenting cells. These APCs then naturally process and present peptides in the context of MHC class II molecules shown here in blue. These MHC class II molecules then present peptides that are normally around 15 amino acids or so in, in length, to CD4 positive helper T cells. And it's this engagement between the uh, TCR on the, positive, on the CD4 positive cells and the MHC class II peptide complexes, which can then, um, following cognate interaction, can then drive uh, activation of these CD4 T cells. And that activation leads to proliferation of those cells. It lead, uh, and that um, clonal expansion 
um, means that those cells, are, there are going to be a high in number. They're also going to be producing cytokines, which will then lead on to uh, naive B cells becoming uh, memory B cells and ultimately becoming plasma cells producing antibodies. Now, these antibodies can, of course, then be targeting the actual therapeutic itself, therefore neutralizing its effect. And this loss of efficacy or can even alter the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics within the patients. Um, but also one serious side effect could be um, cross-reactivity. And this has been shown in some contexts, ultimately leading in death. And so cross-reactive immune responses against endogenous proteins is obviously really the, the high uh, red flag signal of any kind of therapeutic. So we're not normally talking about dangers as, as critical as that, but it can be the case. And so what we do at ProImmune is we have incorporated a number of different assay platforms to assess the risk of different therapeutics. And Tim's mentioned some of those already, and I'll take you through these uh, in today's talk. Many of the tools that we have available uh, are using uh, PBMCs from healthy donors. And these healthy donors are sourced from the UK National Health Service um, uh, 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 in the UK, so the blood and transplant service here. And these PBMCs are processed according to ProMune's optimized protocols. Uh, we do a full HLA typing on these donors, so we know their DR, DP, DQ uh, uh, um, genetic status. And these cells are then cryopreserved, ready for use in the majority of the assays I'm going to be talking about, unless I specifically mention those otherwise. And the advantage here is that we then have a large number of cells available to use. Uh, we have the cells that have got specific HLA types, so we can then use those cells to give a broad genetic diversity in the assays that we're using. We can also select donors of specific HLA types if there's a specific need to do so. So the first assay I'm going to be talking about is called ProPresent, uh, which is also referred to as MAPS, which is the MHC-associated peptide proteomics. And this is a tool which uses mass spectrometry to sequence um, naturally processed and presented peptides from a protein of interest. It's really powerful because it allows you to really look at the, the range and the repertoire of peptides that are being presented from your therapeutic of interest. You can use it to evaluate the impact of protein modifications, such as half-life extensions we've just been hearing about. You can use it to um, even address, address the drug mode of action. And of course, you can use it not just in um, antibody therapeutics like we've been talking about already, but also in the context of target identification for vaccines or other immune therapies, or even in oncology. Um, the data I'm going to be sharing today focuses on MHC class 2. We can look at uh, DR, DP and DQ loci independently or all together, depending on what you're interested in. But we also have the service available to look at MHC class 1 as well, where that's relevant. It's a really rapid tool, allows you to look at multiple test articles fully analysed in just a few weeks. And there's a huge amount of data um, out there. And some of these publications I'm going to be talking about in a bit more detail and others are listed there. So you, we can share those with you as well. So the tool, um, the ProPresent assay essentially uh, works by taking the therapeutic protein itself. So we need the protein from the client. The protein is then loaded into an immature monocyte derived dendritic cell, which then naturally process and processes and presents those uh, peptides from that protein in the context of MHC class two. Um, following that upregulation of MHC class two and, and the maturation of the dendritic cells, the DCs are then lysed and an immunoprecipitation occurs where we use an antibody to pull down all the MHC class two alleles of interest. And that can be DR, DP or DQ. The peptides then are looted from the groove of the MHC, um, isolated and then uh, analyzed by tandem LC-MSMS. What we do is we generate a database, which is an entire human proteome. And on top of that, we add in the sequence of your therapeutic protein of interest. And reported to you are all the peptides from your therapeutic protein that are then identified as being presented in the context of that particular donor, depending on the immunoprecipitation that has been performed. So this data set is actually an example of the repertoire of peptides that you could observe from an antibody therapeutic. And as you can see here, uh, each of the different donors that have been used uh, has the HLA type described as well. So we're looking at DR here. So each donor will express two different DR alleles, DR4 and DR1501 in this case. And the, the peptide that's been identified is also described along, the amino acid, along with the amino acid sequence and what is uh, described as an expect value. The expect value, best way of interpreting it, is a match to the predicted mass um, of that particular peptide. And so um, an expect value of less than 0 0.05 is indicative of peptide identity. And so we highlight these in, in, uh, in blue. Uh, 
And what you'll typically see is that there are a set of overlapping nested sequences from the same region. And this is very classical in regards to how MH MHC class two presents peptides from proteins. So typically you may just see one single peptide or you may see multiple peptides being presented from a specific region. And of course, because all the different donors are expressing different HLA types, um, the best way of viewing this data is really it's an entirety when you step back and you look at a whole panel of donor of a variety of different HLA types. And you can see the relative risk um, of presentation of different sequences. So here, um, out of the four key regions that are being presented from this particular protein, what we can see is that the same sequence is presented promiscuously in all of these uh, nine donors shown here. So fragments the numbers of fragments from this particular peptide are shown as a number. So um, donor 011 here, um, there are six fragments from this particular donor that are, that are identified from this, from this sequence. Um, other peptides just come up in one donor. So we've got two fragments from this donor 11, two fragments from donor 5, two fragments from donor 14, sorry, five fragments from donor 14 here. So this idea of promiscuity um, doesn't necessarily directly um, translate into T-cell antigenicity. That's very important to point out, and I'll describe that a, a little bit later. But what it does do is allows us to identify those peptides which could potentially be at a higher risk of immunogenicity because of the fact they combine to multiple different alleles and in, are identified in multiple donors as well. So the next stage on from this uh, approach is to then identify peptides um, that are actually functionally relevant. And that uh, is where we would use the PROMAP T-cell proliferation assay. And I'll talk about the PROMAP assay in a little bit later. But before we do that, I'm gonna briefly discuss a couple of case studies. The first is using Vitreptococ alpha. Uh, Vitreptococ alpha is an engineered factor 7A analog, which was developed by Nova Nordisk. Now factor 7A had been used for a very long time with no reports of clinical immunogenicity. But Nova Nordisk decided that it would be a great idea to sequence modify this to increase its enzymatic activity. And they did this by introducing just three amino acid substitutions, one N-terminal and two C-terminal two C mutations that were neighboring each other. Now, all was looking good, but when they got to the phase three trial, uh, anti-drug antibody inhibitors were observed in some patients. And so because this is a sort of a last stage uh, therapy, um, drug development was really discontinued immediately by Nova Nordisk. And the question was asked and published, how can we ensure that these neoepitopes that have been inadvertently introduced, um, uh, we, we can learn from our mistakes and not do this again in the future. One of the assays that Nova Nordisk did, and this is published in a paper from Casper Lambeth in 2017, was to do a, a MAPS assay, and they did a comparison of an in-house assay versus one they uh, worked with ProImmune on. And the remarkable thing here is that without any um, assay protocol sharing or any donor sharing, these assays were done completely independently. Exactly the same region of peptides were identified, comparing um, the Vitreptococ alpha to the recombinant uh, factor 7A. And the key point uh, is that these, this particular sequence that actually incorporated the, um, uh, the C-terminal mutation was where immunogenicity was identified. And this was confirmed by the use of functional T-cell proliferation assays. So if we look at the graph on the right-hand side, the wild-type sequence shown in dark blue, um, the 158V variant and 158D, which was the mutated version, there was no differences between these uh, two different sequences. So the N-terminal mutation uh, did not cause any, any immunogenicity issues. But when we look at the 296 and 298 mutation, the mutated version compared to the wild type drove significantly stronger responses. And when these two peptides were combined, that was also extremely strong. So this particular sequence was identified as being uh, really the, the, the key causing agent of the unwanted immune responses. And a lot of additional analysis was performed in, in this paper describing HLA binding um, and uh, a lot of other analyses as well. So immunogenicity was the root cause failure of this drug. And out of these three mutations, Unfortunately, two of them um, ultimately resulted in high affinity binding to HLA-DR alleles, and that resulted in T-cell activation. The other thing, or the other lesson to learn was that that wasn't picked up in the phase one and two trials. They were too small. So how we really need to think about how to um, assess the risk of these potential issues upstream, because learning this lesson downstream is, is really not uh, acceptable. Um, and in this case, the great news was that the results of these um, preclinical assessment tools that were applied reflected the clinical outcome. 
So the next case study is also sticking to haemophilia, but actually looking at um, uh, factor eight, which is obviously a very large protein. Um, and this was a seminal study published uh, last year by uh, Jankowski at the FDA, where not only will be using healthy volunteers, but also um, through a collaboration uh, with the University of North Carolina, are able to access haemophilia patient cells. So at ProImmune, we received those haemophilia patient cells, and we were able to then generate uh, monocyte-derived dendritic cells and then load them with factor eight. And we were comparing the, the processing and presentation of factor eight um, in both uh, haemophilia patients and healthy donors as well. So haemophilia patient data is shown in pink, pink bars, and in blue we have the healthy donors. And what we can see remarkably is the, com the comparability of these two different uh, cellular sets. So actually the difference that there was there was really um, a striking coordination of presentation between both healthy donors and haemophilia patients, which really adds to our knowledge of understanding the, um, the usefulness of these kinds of assays in healthy, donor, um, in healthy donors. So in this particular study, not only we were looking at um, factor eight generally, but this was actually looking at full length uh, recombinant factor eight versus plasma derived factor eight. And I would commend the study to you to, to look at this because there's a lot of um, interest in a, an additional set of peptides were presented in the full, in the full length recombinant factor eight plus von Willebrand factor. Uh, which binds to factor eight in a very high affinity way, comparing it that to the plasma derived factor eight. And so that then led to a lot of hypotheses as to why that is. And that actually correlates to what's seen in the clinic, that uh, recombinant factor eight actually leads to higher levels of um, unwanted uh, anti-drug antibodies against that uh, molecule, comparing it to the plasma derived factor eight. On the right hand side, I just want to point out that the number of peptides that are identified in this assay are significantly higher with HLA-DR compared to DP and NDQ at the lowest end. And that's what to correlates very much with the level of expression that is known for, for DR versus DP versus DQ. That's not to say that DQ and DP aren't important. There are many cir circumstances where peptides presented on those low, low side can certainly drive very strong T-cell responses. But this is just from a point of view of understanding the number of peptides identified in this assay. Um, this uh, is a comparison as well, just focusing on the fact, full length factor eight and the plasma derived factor eight, and also a product developed by CSL bearing called Avstila, which is a B domain deleted version of factor eight. And actually the, um, the Avstila product, as you can see in the middle slide here, and the plasma derived factor eight had very comparable um, antigen processing and presentation patterns of the repertoire of peptides there when you compare that to the full length factor eight. And again, there's a, um, a nice abstract from Marco Hoffman and uh, a talk from Zubin Sauna at the FDA available on our website if you want to learn a little bit more about that. This assay has also been used for therapeutic antibodies. So uh, Jad Mamri actually spoke at our meeting a couple of years ago, um, demonstrating how this assay was used to compare ipilimumab and nivolumab as well. So on to the functional T-cell assays, which Tim, Tim has mentioned, um, the, the ProMap T-cell proliferation assay. These are assays which allow us to identify the functional relevance of specific peptides that can drive those immune responses. Um, we use CD8 depleted PBMCs from a panel of healthy donors, and these donors are all fully HLA typed. We then work with generating overlapping peptides from your protein of interest, or we can use individual sequences that have been identified through in silico um, or any other um, parameters or methodologies that you're using. In fact, um, often we're using peptides that have been identified as being presented by ProPresent as well. This assay just uses peptides. So we synthesize the peptides synthetically and we do a co-culture of PBMCs over a seven day period. The PBMCs are labeled with an intracellular dye called um, CFSE, and CFSE um, labels all those intracellular proteins. And so when the cells divide, the daughter cells then um, spread the dye equally between themselves. And so the, the uh, fluorescent intensity then halves after each proliferation. And that can be then used to quantify the proliferation over that period of time. Um, this is an example of some um, proliferation data. So we have controls, of course, PPD as a, a positive control on the left-hand side and KLH. This confirms a very strong memory and naive T-cell response in 100% of the donors the majority of times. We also include a CEFT peptide pool, which is CMV, EBV, influenza and tetanus. And again, a very strong response to that recall antigen peptide pool. And then finally, the, the last control is what we call uh, the, the KLH 
peptide pool. And these are actually peptides that are identified from uh, keyhole limpet hemocyanin through the MAPS assay, the ProPresent assay, again, driving a strong T cell response. And this is useful because it just shows that the donors that we're using are capable of driving those very strong T cell responses that we don't want to see. But of course, what we're really interested in is are the peptides that we're designing into our therapeutics, are they capable of driving these T cell responses. And that's where, for example, peptide three here, where we see five donors responding, um, this would be a, a, in the kind of the amber range of, well, th this is something that's certainly a peptide that you'd want to have a look at and take more caution over if you're taking this forward um, through your studies. We're normally looking at a panel of 40 or 50 donors here, which represents a very broad um, HLA type. The next assay that I'm going to talk about is our ProCERN dendritic cell T cell assay, which is a whole protein comparative analysis tool. And in the same way that we generate dendritic cells for the ProPresent assay, we do for this assay as well. So the immature dendritic cells are loaded with your protein of interest and the, um, the DCs are then matured. But then in, what happens then is we co-culture them with CFSE labeled PBMCs that are autologous. So the PBMCs are from the same donor and any proliferation that's then observed following labeling and flow cytometry analysis after seven days is a direct result of peptides that have been processed and presented by those dendritic cells to the T cells or indeed any other contaminating factors that might be present in that protein that we, you'd want to know about whether that was driving a T cell response as well. So this assay allows us in a very sensitive way to compare different molecules. It's typically used as a lead selection tool where you have a number of molecules all expressed in the same system and we can then generate a response index which measures the percentage of donors responding by the average strength of that response as well. And as you can see here from a case study from a company called Elasmogen that are working on a technology called Solomers, which are shark derived um, uh, venar molecules. This was uh, allowed them to identify uh, the sequences which, which had lower immune responses in regards to the, T, the dendritic cell T cell assay. And so in this case, the BB10 molecule is a molecule based on obviously all the other information that you generate as part of your preclinical assessment um, would be the molecule to take forward. Um, this assay has also been used not only for looking at kind of classical comparing overall T cell antigenicity from an epitope perspective, but also the impact of host cell protein contamination as well. So HCP is a very important factor. And so this assay can be used later stage as well um, with looking at different batch, uh, batches of proteins that have been generated. Um, the last assay I want to talk about is cytokine storm. And many of you will know that first infusion reactions um, are quite normal, but um, they can be quite serious. And back in well, more than 10 years ago now, uh, TGNR 1412 uh, antibody uh, generated near fatal clinical responses in all the test subjects in a phase one trial. And since then, there's been a huge amount of interest in working with assays that can really uh, identify and characterize relevant risks associated with these molecules that can obviously have a, a big impact on immune modulation. And so now, um, the, the very recent um, uh, clinical uh, guidance or cl uh, guidance from the uh, regulators uh, and it's just important to point this out. So back in February the non-clinical safety evaluation of immunotoxic potential of drugs and biologics guidance came out from the FDA and um, they are expecting sponsors when submitting data to the agency that in vitro assays assessing immune activation, cytokine release and ligand receptor interactions in human cells um, include an assessment of the potential for cytokine release syndrome caused by therapeutic proteins using unstimulated human cells in both plate bound and soluble formats with appropriate positive and negative controls and that these assays are considered critical for hazard identification. So I think it's really important just to point out the, 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 um, the huge kind of important nature of doing these kinds of analyses wherever you're working with a, an immune modulating therapeutic. They also state in, in guidance as well um, that Amy uh, Rosenberg mentioned in her talk to the immunogenicity assessment for therapeutic protein products uh, from 2014, the data from animal studies should be supplemented by in vitro assessment of cellular activation, including proliferation and cytokine release in human whole blood or PBMCs, and that measurement of a cytokine panel should be as broad as possible and include IL-6, interferon gamma and TNF-alpha. Um, so ProStorm um, just to explain a little bit about, about the format of the assay, we're working with a whole blood, um, fresh whole blood assay. So this is one of those assays where we're not working with our cryopreserved PBMC samples. 
These are fresh whole bloods. So we're working with healthy volunteers that come in specifically for this study. Um, blood is uh, drawn into up to 50 mils of blood is drawn into sodium heparin tubes as standard. And that blood is then taken straight up into the laboratory um, within two hours uh, to incubate with your test articles of interest at a range of concentrations. The assay controls include PBS and uh, SEB. And we typically, although it's not compulsory, of course, uh, we would run a low response comparator and high response comparator as well. So Herbitux being the low and Campath high. We then uh, do a 24 hour, incub 24 hour incubation. Um, and then we isolate the plasma and we quantify interferon gamma, TNF alpha, IL-2, 4, 6, 8 and 10 um, by multiplexed immunoassay. And we also offer the option for an additional range of uh, cytokines and chemokines as well, depending on the specific mode of action of your therapeutic. Um, we can turn these assays around in just four weeks and that is really kind of a uh, leading uh, service that we're providing. And I think just want to point out what you might expect to see from this. So this is uh, a set of data in this example looking at IL-6 measurements um, across a range of different uh, test articles at different concentrations. So on the left hand side we've got PBS which is our baseline, our negative control, and then SEB we've got the median levels all um, plotted with this horizontal red bar. Um, what you can see with Remicade is that as you, as you increase from 0 0.1 to 100 micrograms per mil, the median value actually stays on the baseline. There are certainly individual donors that will, will respond and produce IL-6, but the median value stays on the baseline. If we aggregate um, the, the protein, there is an element of, um, uh, of activation here. So for example, when you aggregate Remicade at the same concentration to 100 micrograms per mil, you induce a significant amount of IL-6 uh, production. This is stir-stressed protein. Again, highlighting the importance of um, biophysical characterization of your products. Herbitux, which is our low response comparator, again, the median is on the baseline. And then Campath, which we know induces a strong um, cytokine storm in patients, which is typically mitigated by the use of um, anti-inflammatory steroid treatment. Um, we have uh, an increased concentration, which is dose dependent. And then there are other proteins here, but typically we're, we're using this assay to look at maybe a single tox batch of protein that uh, our clients are working with. And this allows you to then really measure what the overall effects are of, um, uh, of this particular molecule in, a, in an assay, which is as close to the clinical analysis as you could have. So it's a cytokine release assay for hazard identification and risk management. It's a really simple whole blood assay system which minimizes any test system interference. And the observations that we have here is that the, the data correlates very much between the clinically observed response and what is measured in ProStorm. We have a very flexible study design so we can work with a range, an extended range of cytokine and chemokines. And we also offer both the soluble and plate bound uh, version of this assay. And the whole um, service is delivered in just four weeks. So just to summarize, um, really, I hope I've convinced you that managing drug immunogenicity from the earliest possible stage is really important to giving yourself the ability to win the drug markets of the future. And generating this key immunogenicity data allows you to differentiate your biologic from the competitors. Because so many molecules, I guess, are against similar targets, um, immun low immunogenicity is really important from a patient perspective as well as a commercial perspective. Um, you'll need access to a wide range of specialist assays to, to do this. Um, and with Promune's breadth of experience and the integrated platform that we have of our best in class assays, um, that will really save you time, money, and reduce your overall project risk. We have a really extensive range of experience with different types of therapeutic entities, so some of them are listed there. Um, and the list goes on and continues to extend. Um, and so, yeah, I would certainly welcome any questions if there's time, Emily. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jeremy. Um, there are some questions. Um, Amy, I'm gonna have you ask Jeremy. Let me just go ahead and ask you to unmute. Okay, Amy. Actually, Amy, I can see a question. Yeah, I can, about, you're wondering okay. whether the, yeah, um, the response to the treptocog um, cross-reacts to non-modified. Right, did it, yes. Definitely. Yes, did it, did it uh, cross-react to the, the normal factor seven, that which would really increase the risk. Yeah, so I think um, the, the data, as far as I remember, the data from the, the, clinical, the clinical data, the phase three data, um, I, I believe that was really why it was pulled. And, and that, was, that was the case. So, um, because obviously as soon as they saw any of those safety signals, that was a massive, massive problem because nothing could be done about it. It's a lot for last defense. So it, that, that was my understanding from that, from that work. 